Um, welcome everyone to CPWR's webinar. My name is Trish Quinn. I'm the program coordinator for CPWR Small Studies Program. So we're glad you could all join us today. Um, in, this, in today's hour long webinar, we will hear from three university researchers that have completed research on exploring the use of drones in construction. And these studies were all funded through CPWR Small Studies Program. If you're not familiar with the Small Studies Program, it's part of CPWR's cooperative agreement with NIOSH. Uh, it provides successful applicants with seed money of up to $30,000 and the flexibility to initiate short-term studies up to 12 months in time. Um, funding is currently available. It's a rolling admissions process, so you can submit a letter of intent at any time. Um, if you're interested, you can check out the CPWR website um, to learn how to apply and to see a completed list of current studies um, and topics. And Tyler's going to drop the, um, the link to that in this chat box. Um, according to the recent survey of construction companies conducted by Dodge Data and Analytics, 37% of contractors are currently using drones on their job sites, with an additional 6% expecting to begin in the near future. Drones give users the ability to observe job sites and track progress, but they can also play a critical role in assessing and monitoring workplace hazards and safety concerns. So we have three presentations today that are gonna address some of these issues. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing our panel. Um, our first presenter today is, will be Dr. Rod Handy. He is with the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine at the University of Utah. Dr. Handy received his AAS and BS degrees from Purdue, an MBA from Ball State, and a PhD in Environmental Engineering Sciences from the University of Florida. His past industrial experiences have included five years as an engineer with Ford Motor Company and two years as an electromechanical technician with a small computer floppy disk firm. His previous academic experiences include eight years at Western Kentucky University, eight years at Purdue University, and three years in the North Carolina system. Our second presenter today is Dr. Masood Ghassari. He is an assistant professor in the Rinker School of Construction Management at the University of Florida. He is leading the Human Centered Technology and Construction Research Group. His research focuses on the theoretical and experimental investigation of human computer robot systems in construction. To date, he has authored, authored over 100 peer reviewed papers in the fields of virtual and augmented reality and human drone interaction in construction. His research has been supported by several agencies, including CPWR, the National Science Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Labor, and Electra International. He also serves as an associate editor for the ASCE's Journal of Computing and Civil Engineering. Our third presenter today is Ia Shu. She's a PhD student in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering at Oregon State University. Her research focuses on remote sensing and artificial intelligence applications for construction automation and safety management. Welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Handy is gonna be our first presenter. So if we could pull up his slides, please. Hello everyone, um, I'm, I'm Rod Handy. I've been at the University of Utah for, this is my seventh year. Um, and I have you know, been working with some researchers, as you can see, I'm the PI on the project um, that we have uh, Dr. Abbas Rashidi and Dr. Doris Sleeth that are both at the University of Utah. And back when we started the project, Dr. Trenton Honda was also at the uh, University of Utah in um, the same department that I'm in. Now he's at Northeastern University and he's an associate dean there. So what we did um, is we worked with, um, I guess we got the funding a couple, almost it was right about two years ago now, to look at the, using drones at residential construction sites, in particular, to see the effects of removing particulate matter from the air, as well as to be able to provide some uh, benefits when it comes to heat stress. So we've got kind of a twofold um, um, direction there, but I'm going to introduce the rest of our team, our project team. Again, I'm the PI, and then 
Trent is a co-investigator. I, I think I should mention as I'm going through this is how we came up with the idea. And it was Trent and I talking in his office one day. He had seen something on NPR about one of the cities in China that was using drones to be able to clean up the air and looking and basically at air pollution. And then as I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know, this might be something we could do with heat stress as well as be able to provide a nebulized um, type drone event where it, or several, um, you know, um, drones that are running in a swarm to basically be able to cool down the area. And of course, out in Utah, we have, um, particularly down in St. George, which is where one of the sites are, we're on the, um, on the corner of the Mojave Desert. So we have very dry, we're not sure if we were too dry that we would end up, um, not, um, the, evap you know, the, the spray that we were spraying would evaporate before it even got down to ground level where it was any benefit, especially for heat stress. And, um, but him and I talked about it and then we submitted and we're fortunate to be able to get to grant and thank CPWR for that. It has provided, um, you know, an opportunity for an area of investigation that we want to continue to pursue. Dr. Abbas Rashidi is a, I think he's promoting, getting promoted to associate level, but he is a, in the civil engineering department. And I became acquainted with him because of his interest in construction safety. Dr. Sleeth is in the same department with me, and she's also a CIH and a co-investigator that I work with a lot. Trent Henry, uh, the department started out, um, you know, because of his interest in environmental issues and things. With our department, we have several people doing um, environmental health and safety type research. So he's a senior associate, uh, research associate in our department, helps out a lot with the data analysis. And then Ali and Muhammad are two doctoral students that work with Dr. Rashidi in civil engineering. And, and they're both um, certified drone pilots. Project overview, essentially what we did is we, um, we acquired a water misting drone. And we deployed that during the months of 2021, we had a difficult time the first year because we had the funding and we had a difficult time being able to secure the sites because of COVID, to be quite honest. It was difficult to get anyone to buy on, buy into allowing us on sites, even though they were outdoor environments, just, just because of the unknown and the uncertainties with COVID and the health and safety issues associated with that. But um, so we, we delayed it worked on getting a little bit of pilot data and just constructing, making sure that, um, you know, that we had all the, all the stuff that we needed to do the project and do it right. And we started out with Salt Lake City as the site because that's where the University of Utah is at, with the intention to move down to St. George and go into a construction, a residential construction area there whenever they would allow us on site. And it just happened to be there was, these were both done in the summer months of 2021. We used, um, and we basically, we didn't set up any personal sampling. We used area sampling and we used the widget or the wet bulb globe temperature. You know, one of the common ones that you would find ones that we have in our program as well as one to use for quality control. And then we used a, a particulate matter, a direct reading instrument to do 12 pilot runs all together. And again, since it's a small scale study and just we are trying to, to um, you know, prove a kind of a proof of concept and that this could be done and that we could get some pilot data. We chose 10 minute pre-flight stage where we didn't have the drone flying. There was no net, um, there was no spraying or misting at that time. Then we had a 10 minute flight stage where we were having mit, um, you know, the drone mist and traversing a um, area that I'll get to here in a minute. And then we um, looked at the 10 minute post-flight stage. And again, we were looking at particulate it matter in the air as well as what it does, what this does to the area widget values. I should mention that we had some problems because the the drone that we purchased and we were trying to get it um, to arrive last Christmas and it was stolen in shipment. So, and we never did find it or they never found it. So we had to get another drone that we purchased with funds that we were able to cobble together. So we had two aims and I kind of mentioned them already. We were going to look at particulate matter. We were gonna measure those 
immediately after water dis, um, dispersing drones are deployed and then having you know a baseline before and see if there was statistically significantly lower concentrations afterwards. That was our first aim. Our second aim was, as I've mentioned with, with the widget, we wanted to know if during the flight, we would, if the values would go down significantly, statistically significant, as well as how long it would take for it to recover once we stopped the drone from flying so that we could get an idea of, of how, if this needed to be a continuous operation or how, how um, often a drone would need to be flown and um, so on. Again, that's the two aims. Our methods um, involved, again, just some direct reading instruments and then the, the equipment to be able to make sure that we are able to, to keep the altitude of the drone. And um, as it says, there are two heat stress monitors. One was just used for QAQC to make sure that our, the widget that we were using, and these were 3M widgets. And then we used a TSI particulate monitor, monitor um, and again, gathered the data, took a, a sample for, um, for the widget every 20 seconds. And then we had the particulate monitor running um, continuously and collecting the data. We had a, a DJI agricultural misting drone, and this drone was capable of carrying a payload of 22 pounds or 10 liters of water. We'll get to the reasons that we, there are some difficulties with the battery technology here in a few minutes, just being able to handle that load, that, that, that amount of a payload. The infrared distance measuring device and kept us at about 20 feet altitude. We tried to stay very close to that. And then the tripods and the step stools to be able to put it as close as we could into the breathing zone of a typical construction worker. And the two sites we used was a family housing construction site on the University of Utah campus that we were able to secure. And then on St. George, there's a, a community called The Ledges. It's a residential community that's close to, um, and it's located on a golf course and a lot of construction and a lot of, a lot of new construction going up when we were, um, we were on site. Again, I mentioned about the mean altitude of 20 feet. We couldn't hold it at that all the time, but we, we tried to, again, keep it very close to that. Uh, the drone missed it. It's 10 liter payload, and we'd set it at one liter per minute for a duration of 10 minutes. And then we had a 250 foot um, square foot site looking at the data in particular um, of other studies where there are static or stationary nebulizers that are being used to cool down workers. It seemed to, you know, to make sense in, in um, coming up with, especially with just running one drone like we were at one liter per minute for 10 minutes at about a 50 by 50 plot. It was also controllable, controllable and, um, you know, being and making sure that that we you know, had the proper safety protocols on site and, and, and having the, you know, limited number of people out, out on the actual site. We had to you know, keep a very, uh, be very conscientious of that. And then again, you can see uh, with the widget and the PM monitor, we tried to get as close and simulate what the way it's supposed to be used. And uh, from the uh, manual that 3M provided for the widget, as well as the particulate matter for about five foot above ground is about the breathing zone. For each of those test, run, test runs, the data was collected and for both widget and PM and was collected for 10 minutes to get this baseline or what we call the pre-flight. And then during the 10 minute flight section, you know, again, we're running it at that point, traversing it, and I'll show you uh, pretty much the way it was traversed it across the um, this section, this 250 square foot area. And then afterwards, we wanted to see how long um, that it would hold and how quickly it would get back to where it was either um, the particulate matter was, you know, was, was high, as high as it was before or within that range somewhere, as well as what happens to the widget values. Here's a picture of a site set up in St. George. Um, one thing that happened, we had a, uh, an unpaid industrial hygiene student too that was working on a project, but because of personal reasons, he had to, to leave the project. So I got to act as a PI and as the graduate student on this along in the picture, you can see there that that's Ali, one of the doctoral students. And then me in the center there, um, and then 
you know, kind of controlling there. You can kind of see the site. There were people moving in and out. There was construction, excavation. There were all different types of things going on. These types of kind of Adobe style um, homes were all single level. And some had varied a little bit on as far as uh, the rooftop and the way the configuration. But in the, on the left picture, you can see the, the drone over top of my, you know, running above me and that um, particular photo. And then on the right is again, where the, uh, the TSI particulate monitor with Ollie looking at that and me looking at the widget. And that's the kind of site and that's the, you know, kind of the corner of the Mojave Desert, if you're not familiar with St. George, Utah. That's the type of construction site that we would have for one of the locations. And then it's a little bit different in Salt Lake. This was at the family housing and you can see some of the stuff that's going on. It was much, uh, it was probably more controlled than what a lot of construction sites would be because there was various activities. People were well, had been alerted and, and knew what we were doing and knew what to expect. Um, had a lot, you know, had questions to begin with and, and then kind of moved around here, you don't see a lot of people on site, but you, again, this was a construction of a, a new family housing from an old family housing after they had tore it down. This shows you the directional traverse that we tried to follow. Remember running at 20 feet high and then we're moving along on a 50 by 50 plot to be able to collect the data to see what happens. And it, that was the paths that we you know, that was run as you can see in the left diagram and then the right diagram is just another one showing it actually neb nebulized. And one of the things we were worrying about flying the drone was would all this water evaporate before it had any effect. And the, um, the good news is um, since I was standing under it and you know, I could really benefit from, you know, the 100 degree temperature day or 100 degree plus as it went by. And, and not only that, but also the propellers that are on the drone itself help to, you know, pick up the, you know, pick up a breeze a little bit, which even provided even a little more of a cooling effect and then, um, you know, again, anticipated probably. But um, again, you can hopefully see the spring in the right diagram. And again, it did get down, it didn't uh, get down and, and soak me below. It just felt like pretty much a cooling effect. It was about the right height for the, the um, altitude, or the altitude was just about where it needed to be for the dryness of the air and the temperature of the air that day. What we found and the key findings from the study is that with the widget values that we had um, come up with during this, these different uh, pilot, these 12 runs, it averaged about 1.7 Fahrenheit degrees lower than the pre-flight and the post-flight stages of the test. This, um, when we looked at the literature on it and, and it and um, you know, put together the project proposal and so on with stationary nebulizers. It seemed to make sense um, that we would lose, you know, we would go down one or two, maybe three degrees in some cases. These were statistically significant values. You can see the p value there. Um, after we tried to do the particulate matter, I mean, and then it was wet deposition associated with, with that, and you'll see with the, the other graphs I have on the, the following slides that the air was not statistically significantly cleaner than it was prior to the misting event. So if we were going to do that, we would look at a different strategy than the one that we used, basically. Another thing was the battery life um, was a major constraint for all the runs. And we had significant drainage um, with a heavy water payload. So at the very beginning, the battery um, would drain down, um, you know, because of the 10 liters. And then it would drain down, down at a slower rate, but still we could, we, you know, we wanted to make sure we got through, and that's why we picked 10 minutes. We wanted to go 15 or 20 with, with this, and we just decided to, to kind of change our strategy there a bit. The other thing that I want to note in the first bullet there is that there was really, in some cases, greater than a three degree reduction from the widget values, even though 1.7 was the average. Again, the dirty air and the clean air, we couldn't tell a whole, whole lot of difference. There was some marginally lower values in the post, especially at the beginning of the, of the, um, the post flight. But um, another thing we note in, as far as key findings is in order to get the significant widget reductions and then marginal air particulate cleaning at a site, it, um, it is our opinion it would be necessary to keep drones deployed 
um, almost continuously. Um, and then with current battery technology, this you know would be challenging, but it's it's certainly still plausible. Let me show you a few diagrams. This is the widget results. Don't worry so much about the bond time sequence. It's basically a 30 minute time frame. And what we had is, is we took um, three readings uh, a minute. That's why you see it going out to, to 90. But notice the center of the this area here is when the drone is being run and it's spraying its um, spraying its its payload. You can see uh, you know quite a bit of difference between that in the pre and the post flight. Notice the recovery of the temperature though, and how my you know my claim of having it run continuously or having several drones that are on site rather than just trying to run run one at a time like we were doing would make sense. This is the PM results, particularly looking at these two, the pre and the post. And notice again, there's not much difference in that and statistically there was not. Now, of course, it's gonna go up here and this is why you're seeing it because we're aerosolizing, you know, we've got the, um, the water in the air and, you know, and it's picking, the, the instrument's picking that up. So from our results, um, we have, and I should say before I even get to, the, to what's on the screen here, is we've got a paper submitted to the Journal of Construction Engineering, and the doctoral students have you know, worked on that along with what we'd already had done. And, and basically, we'd like to do a, a, an R21 or something similar, but we will change, if we do anything with PM and trying to characterize that, we will change our strategy some. Thanks, Rod. Uh, Masood, I am going to hand over control to you so you can share your screen now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let me minimize this also. Sorry. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Masood Gassari. I'm an assistant professor in the Rinker School of Construction Management at the University of Florida. And here is a sh short presentation I've prepared about some of our recent work on using drones for construction safety. Um, uh, I have received several projects through CPWR and uh, like and continuous project, uh, like and use them as C to uh, continuous project from NSF and DOL. So I want to provide an overall pictures of some of those projects because they are all related to each other. Uh, so in 2009, <laughs> when I was a PhD student at Georgia Tech 13 years ago, I'm not that old, uh, I was doing research on drones. And I remember at the beginning, uh, uh, when I was working on the topic, I was thinking that drone is like a backpack that you can wear and if, uh, and it can help you to get anywhere you want on the job side. So this is a video actually almost five or six years uh, from five or six years ago, which shows a technology called Flyboard Air uh, that you could stand uh, on a flyboard uh, with a backpack that can allow you to fly up to 10,000 feet uh, with a speed of uh, almost 90 uh, mile per hour. Hopefully you don't want to do that. Uh, this shows that I wasn't thinking that much outside of the box and I believed uh, that it should be just a matter of time that we might see affordable and hopefully safer version of such technology on the job site. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, uh, I'm not here to talk about those type of aerial platform. Uh, this presentation is about a uh, common type of uh, drones which have been used in the built environments, uh, such as the rotary wing, uh, which uh, are commonly used for vertical type of construction, for building type of construction. Uh, we have fixed wings also, which look like an airplane, and uh, they are commonly used for horizontal type of construction highways. Uh, uh, and transportation applications, uh, they have been heavily using this type of uh, drone. And I've also seen a, a few examples of using blimps in both indoor and outdoor type of construction. Again, uh, uh, 
Drones uh, uh, in the AEC domain, drones have been used for a wide variety of applications from structure monitoring, bridge inspection, transportation, progress monitoring, post disaster assessment. Usually, construction is the last uh, uh, group to catch up with all other um, uh, heavy civil and uh, other groups in the built environment. Uh, over the last couple of years, I have been conducting research on the use of drones as safety inspection assistance or for safety inspection purposes. Uh, so that's why the drone play the role of safety manager, the safety inspection assistant to safety managers in the jobs. At this presentation, uh, I'll provide an overview of some of those uh, construction safety related projects. So our research in this area can be classified under two specific categories. One, uh, drone for safety, or how we can enhance the construction safety uh, using uh, the drone technology, and also at the same time, safety for drones. Uh, how we could ensure the safe integration of such flying robots, which are going to fly on top of our heads on the job site. So let me first start with the drone for safety uh, and the user center study that we conducted in this area. We did a national survey in the United States in 2019 uh, asking safety managers about the potentials and challenges of drones for construction safety application. The outcome of that study have uh, published in the Safety Science Journal, and here are some of those outcomes. In terms of the application areas, safety managers indicated various hazardous situation or safety-related activities that drone can be used for. For example, uh, for working near unprotected edges and opening or working in, uh, in the blind spots of heavy equipment. As you could see in this table, uh, uh, most of these applications are related to unsafe, inaccessible, or hard to reach locations or blind spots that drones could inspect either in a faster, easier, safer, or even more frequent, the things that the safety managers might need. But at the same time, in terms of the challenges, they reported several, uh, including issues such as technical challenges, flight approval and certification requirement, regulation, uh, regulation uncertainties. However, as you could see on the, on the list, uh, their top concern were first liability and legal issues and concern, and then safety challenges of having drones flying over or close to the human workers on the job site. So uh, now that we understood safety managers' needs and concern, let's see how we can integrate the drone technology for safety inspection application on a real construction site. Here is an example where we use drones for safety inspection of multiple high-rise building uh, uh, construction projects. We investigated the practical benefits and challenges of drones for the safety inspection on those job sites using various data. So we use images, videos, and uh, point cloud data. Images and videos are uh, like the low hanging fruits data that you could uh, get from the drones. But depending on the type of application and depending on the type of sensors that have been mounted on the drones, you could get different type of the data out of the drone. We also generated point cloud data, uh, which is a point cloud of the uh, 3D uh, visualization of the job site using the same video and images. And we also studied how safety managers could integrate such technology and uh, uh, their generated data into their day-to-day -day safety planning and monitoring procedures. And finally, proposed a process map for them. So now they have new data, how they could integrate it into their uh, current activities and where and when they could use them for uh, different activities like hazard identification, producing reports, and other uh, like work that they do. We also assess different type of drone generated visual data, such as images, videos, and point cloud data to see how useful they are uh, for hazard identification purposes or other type of safety planning and monitoring process. Like a simple image can help you a work in proximity to an opening and edge or a lack of guardrail somewhere or worker uh, without safety rope. Uh, and more enhanced type of data like a point cloud can help you to uh, like do some measurements of whether the guardrails have been installed properly, whether that opening has been covered properly or not, uh, which all could be achieved using the same image and video captured from the job site. 
One thing we noticed from these on the site studies that off the shelf drones, uh, such as DJI Phantom. DJI is a company that produced drones and is super popular. It's like an Autodesk of drones uh, that are very popular in construction. Uh, but they have some hardware and software limitation if you want to uh, like fully integrate them uh, for safety monitoring purposes. So these limitations led us to investigate how we could customize a drone or how we could enhance the drone so the outcome can help us uh, for the thing that we wanted to do, which was safety inspection on the upside. So we did a bunch of things. One of them was uh, enhancing the PCB accuracy or the point cloud data that was generated uh, uh, using those images and videos. For example, we worked on enhancing the drone generated point cloud data because in a previous study, we noticed that it was a very, very popular visual data used by safety managers to assess the proper installation, detailed measurements, guardrails, openings, and safety nets. So what we did as a part of our study, we investigated the effect of different navigation systems together with post-processing techniques uh, on the accuracy of the drone-generated point cloud data. We customized an open-source drone platform equipped with a single and dual-frequency navigation system that was capable of georeferencing the captured data using a technology called PPK technology, and the whole thing was we were hoping to enhance the point cloud data accuracy at the end of the day. And again, as you see, uh, we conducted a comparative point cloud uh, accuracy assessment to better understand how different uh, like uh, drone configuration and flight parameters would affect the generated point cloud. Like the, the images you see on top are from a off the shelf DJI Phantom. And then if you go down, you could see like the the, the accuracy of the point cloud increased because of all the point cloud, uh, 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 like the, using all the uh, um, uh, post-processing techniques that we integrate in the system. And finally, we proposed a point cloud accuracy matrix, which illustrate the effect of drone technical configuration and flight parameters that's uh, on the level of the point cloud uh, accuracy. Now, what and which one would be better for the safety managers were uh, if they want to like uh, focusing on guardrails, if they're focusing on opening, if they want to count something, if they want to measure something. Uh, in another study, uh, we explored how we could, uh, okay, now we have the drone, how we could automate the whole process and automating the safety manager task of identifying hazard using drone captured images. So, uh, Again, the limited number of safety managers present on medium or large size construction project and their incapability of conducting frequent site inspection might lead to hazardous situations on those projects. Using drones, we could increase the frequency of safety inspection and we can automate also their hazard identification uh, capabilities. So with the, and these all gonna impact the safety uh, on the job site. In this particular project, we developed a framework for the potential implementation of drones for monitoring fall hazard, specifically guardrails uh, in this high-rise high building project. And this is just a simple picture which shows a three-step machine learning uh, pipeline which we developed to detect guardrails from those images captured from the drone. So the outcome of the research uh, uh, illustrated that our uh, like such automated fall hazard recognition system could improve recognitions of the guardrails and these all can help the safety managers task of identifying hazard in high-rise construction projects. So instead of the safety managers going 20 story up and down, the drone can do a flight, capture, and provide a report that on these levels there are missing guardrails or the guardrail hasn't been properly installed on these specific levels. And Finally, in another study, we also explored how we could ensure the safe yet accurate visual data acquisition by drones without the need to fly over or near populated areas. So in this study, uh, we introduced and assessed ISIC UAS as the first drone platform that we designed for safety inspection purposes with customized features. Two of the most important features that this drone has is as simple as a parachute recovery system, we have cars, they all have airbags. Why we don't have a like an airbag or a parachute recovery system for the drones that kind of fly up on top of our head on the job site? And the other one, we had a super optical zoom capability so we could uh, 
allow the drone to capture the images without being very close to the building, to the trains, and also fly on top of the uh, workers' heads. So we did multiple flight tests to evaluate its technical performance. Also, we deployed it on a real construction site to validate safety inspection capability. The results showed that the parachute recovery system could reduce the fatality uh, probability by more than 40%, which is significant. And in this particular job site that we tested the, this drone platform in, it was flying more than 130 feet away uh, from the building exterior. Although we were far away, but as you could see in these uh, pictures, uh, the super zoom uh, capability helped us identify and inspect significant amount of potential safety hazard without the need, again, to fly over workers or even close to the buildings or uh, several cranes that were uh, present on the job site. So that was the first part of the work, like drone for safety. Now, as we previously indicated, our other category of research was on how we could ensure the safe integration of drone as flying robot on the construction sites or what we call safety for drones. Uh, an example of our research in this category is a series of projects on safety challenges of worker drone interaction uh, that were uh, originally funded by CPWR and now is also funded by National Science Foundation. Uh, let me provide you with a short overview of what these projects are about and what we are planning to achieve in them. Uh, the integration of drone in construction is great, but at the same time, it raises novel safety issues which might make the construction industry even more dangerous than before. Uh, like in our uh, recent paper published at Safety Science, we have categorized all the safety challenges of uh, drone integration to construction under three categories, uh, like physical risks such as struck by falling object, uh, 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 flying object or singing object, dust or, and other these type of emissions that might happen, attentional costs like visual distraction, auditory distraction, cognitive distraction that might uh, bring to the job site, psychological impacts, all the stress or cognitive overload. Uh, in all the projects that we have been there to uh, collect data, all the time there has been one or two workers coming uh, to us and telling me, what are you doing? Are you recording my work? Are you checking my productivity or so there is still also a lot of psychological impact and stress that you might put on the workers uh, by just simply having a drone uh, 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 flying on top of them that we need to better understand. So in, in um, we have been using in, the, in, in these studies simulation and virtual reality techniques to create drone populated virtual replicas of construction job sites where we can safely study uh, safety challenges of drones under different work conditions. Here are a few example scenarios where workers are working on roofs, ladders, and scaffoldings where the drones are introduced to their work environment. Uh, so we are currently, right now, actually, right now we are uh, collecting the data. We are using the power of virtual reality and different sensors to evaluate the effects of drones on workers attentional allocation and also psychological impacts of drones on workers in construction site using a series of ongoing user center experiment in immersive VR. At the same time, we are also uh, using uh, the power of uh, 40 simulation to evaluate the physical risk associated with the operation of drones in construction using different operation, uh, operating condition. In this, uh, in this phase, various uh, construction tasks uh, uh, are 40 simulated in a virtual construction site with virtual workers and drone to evaluate various safety risks posed by drones to virtual workers under different working conditions. This was a lot, but as a concluding remark, like it or not, uh, we are transitioning to a world where different type of drones will be working hand in hand or wing in hand with humans to help them with, uh, with the work they do on the job site. This is not an imagination or science fiction anymore. Actually, the construction industry, as Trish introduced at the beginning of the presentation, is one of the fastest adopters of drone technology and is seeing firsthand how such disruptive technology is changing the construction work. 
but we need to further study different risks and challenges introduced by those drones on job site. Our research is a starting point in this area, and further research is required to properly uh, uh, study such safety challenges. Last but not least, I need to thank all my students and research collaborators for their hard work on this project. I also want to specifically thank CPWR and their small study program, which provided the earliest support and the seed funding for several of these projects. Thank you so much for your attention to my presentation. Thank you very much, Masood. Um, next up, we have Ishu from Oregon State University. Hi. Thanks, Trish. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ye Shu. I'm currently a PhD student from Oregon State University. I'm happy to present over a study that founded by CBWR named a practical model to measure and mitigate the safety risks of using UAS in construction. This study was conducted by um, me and my advisor, Dr. Yalta Turkin. M and aerial systems, as well um, as known as drones, um, have received a lot of attention in recent decades um, because it's it's relatively easy to use. Um, it can run faster than humans to assess the hard to reach areas and transfer the data in terms of um, digital images, uh, videos, and the and the point clouds. And the 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 price for that is affordable. So all of this benefits makes it a good tool to uh, assist the various tasks that in um, different construction phases. However, are they safe enough to be implemented to construction, um, uh, to, to be utilized in construction workflow? So uh, the answer might be no. And uh, based on the data, based on the data, um, from the U.S. Um, Bureau of Labor Statistics in, 19, uh, in, to, in 2019. So there were uh, 1,061 facilities happening in the construction sector, which means this five-person workforce is responsible for almost 20% of the facilities. And among all of these facilities, um, about two-thirds of them are caused by the construction fatal four reasons, um, which is referred to um, the falls um, struck by um, cutting in between and the electrocution. And the use of using UAS in construction that um, may raise the safety concerns um, because they, they probably can crash on the, on the ground, crash uh, to the, the, the structures and the workers, and they also might collect with the, uh, the mid-air object. And also the operation of the UAS that might distract the workers from the work on hand. Um, especially, th this is especially dangerous for the workers they are work on height. And also um, uh, for some specific tasks like the safety inspections, um, so probably you, the, 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 um, they will fly close to the workers that will increase the, the psychological and the physical stress of them. And then the um, in, in, the, in the long run that will um, affect the, the, the worker's health. So all of those potential incident scenarios that, um, uh, that might increase the construction fatal four hazards um, of using UAS in construction and that might worsen the safety performance, the current safety performance. So before we implementing the UAS in construction, it's very important to um, consider the safety level of that, and it's better to assess the, the safety level of using UAS in construction. So that's the goal of our research, which is to develop a practical model to assess the safety level of using UAS in construction from the perspective of the worker safety and health. To achieve this goal, four objectives are uh, need to be accomplished. Mm. So first, we, we need to identify the factors that can lead to occupational safety and health, and health risks associated with the UAS used in the construction. And this, this is accomplished by conducting a literature review. And then we need to verify the, those, those causal factors and quantify them, um, and then identify the, mitigate, the effective mitigation strategies. So objective two to four, 
that is that that was achieved by conducting a three run Delphi method. So based on the literature review, um, there were six groups of um, factors were identified, um, namely UAS, the environment, flight crew, mission, drop site, and contractor related factors. Um, so UAS related factors are are mainly uh, related to the UAS technology and the aircraft itself. And the environment uh, related factors are about the uh, climate, um, the, the factors like the temperature and the, the moisture, the wind, the illumination. And the flight crew related factors that is that those factors refer to, um, uh, that is uh, the factors related to the, the pilots and the, the observers. Um, who, who uh, conducted this UAS flight on construction site. And the mission related factors are about um, um, the, the, what type of tasks the UAS are assisted are assist with. Um, so this specific, that is this specific factors um, for, for the specific use, uses um, in the construction. And drop site related factors are related to the complexity of the drop site. And contractor related factors are, are the, the, the factors that is from the administrative and the management level. Um, after we identify those uh, factors, so a three round Delphi um, surveys were conducted. So uh, the objective of the first round of Delphi survey was to um, provide, was to prepare the identified causal factors um, in this hierarchy. Uh, structure and it provided this to the the um, our panelists and then led them to verify and by providing the level of agreement to um, to identify um, uh, unidentified causal factors by using the five point Likert skill um, and uh, so th th but this is only this is the the one part of of the questions um, in this round um, in this round we also have a set of questions that collect the data about the background information of the participants. Um, because the Delphi, the, the reason of doing that because the Delphi method is, high, the results of the Delphi method is highly related on the, re, the, the reliable of the experts responses. Um, so to this end, we need to, um, we need to evaluate the, the, um, the expertise um, in the related fields. Um, like the safety management, the uh, human and the uh, human and the uh, and the robot uh, interaction, and also the using the drones uh, utilization in construction. And based on the responses we collected from the round one, um, we used the criteria and the score system that conducted by Halliburton and Gambatis to evaluate. Uh, over um, participants' um, expertise. And the, from their studies, they suggested that the total score over 11 um, that identified the, um, the enough expertise in, in, um, in, in, in the Delphi study. And uh, based on the, the, res the 19 responses we collected from the round one, and we can see from the results that all of the, all of the participants are qualified and uh, should be included in the Delphi panelist. And nine of the experts are from the academia and uh, 10 of them are from the industry. So after carefully review and combine uh, the responses from the uh, experts in the round one, um, we, send the, we send the back to the, the experts and ask them whether they would like to change their ratings based on other experts' opinion, uh, opinions. And after this process, we, collect, we received a set, 17 responses and then they were used to perform the descriptive statistic. And the standard deviation less than 1.5 was considered to indicate that the consensus was reached. And from the results, uh, from the results listed in this table, um, so you, you can see like the consensus was reached since the standard deviation of all of the identified causal factors are less than 1.5. And one thing need to be mentioned that even though um, the all of the 17 responses um, even uh, either agree or strongly agree um, that the identified causal factors that should be included. 
uh, based on the median rating we, we calculated. Uh, however, two experts, they, um, they indicate that based, based on the, so given, given the noise level is, um, uh, it, um, it's already very high uh, in the construction site. So the use of UAS, so the, the, the noise gen generated by using UAS con uh, on construction will not make any differences. So um, that makes the standard deviation of this factor is larger than others. And the objective of the second round Delphi method um, was to quantify the causal factors by prioritizing them. Um, in this round, um, so seven pairwise comparison tables was prepared and um, prepared for the experts to provide their relative importance based on the overall safety impact using the linguistic skill. Mm. And based on the characteristic of the pairwise um, comparison table, the, on, the, the, so the experts only need to fill the half of the table and the research team um, f uh, complete the, the, the table after we collect their responses. And then the responses was analyzed by using the fuzzy, uh, a, a, a modified fuzzy analytical hierarchy process. Um, and because of um, the human, uh, because the human judgment um, cannot be perfectly consistent. So we need to, uh, we need to use the, we need to calculate the consistency ratio to ensure that all of the responses are, are reliable. Um, and once they reach the, the satisfied consistency ratio, which is the CR less and e uh, less than equal to uh, 0.1. So the, the responses will then um, um, prepared to establish the fuzzy paired comparison matrix and calculate the local and the global weight of all of the uh, causal factors. And in this round, um, all 17 responses reached the satisfied CR condition um, and that enables us to calculate the, um, the local and the global weight of them and then provide the prioritization of the causal factors. And here I list uh, here here we list the top six um, identified factors based on the second round uh, uh, second round responses. So they are the wind factor and the weight of the UAS, the the US inspection and maintenance, um, and the US speed and the distance to the structure workers, and the, the last one is the feature sophistication and performance. And the second round, the objective of the second of the third round the Delphi process was to identify the effective mitigation methods. Um, given there are 23 causal factors identified in previous stage, so to provide one or multiple mitigation methods for each of the causal factors are are, are a lot of work for the experts. So, um, so the over research team we uh, we. Uh, reviewed the previous studies and technical report and the news and the blogs and the, to provide some mitigation methods for them to select from the uh, from this process and also the they are able to input any um, mitigation method they think they are effective um, and uh, in this the in this round the level of effectiveness of each mitigation method were also collected And in the round three, 13 fully completed responses were collected and a mitigation um, method was retained if it was selected or brought up by more than 50% of the experts. In our case, that is more than seven, um, at least seven experts selected. Um, um, and in the end, the 74 mitigation methods were identified um, and they were categorized um, based on their level of effectiveness. And here we just uh, uh, shows the, the mitigations for the UAS related factors and uh, the entire table can be found in our um, project report. And finally, we can develop the UAS safety assessment model based on the results from the, the Delphi surveys. So for the first, so in, in the first round of um, Delphi 
uh, in the Delphi survey, we verified the level one and the level two factors. And um, in the second round, we calculated the, the local and the global um, weights for, uh, for all of that, the, the um, causal factors. And in the third round, we identified the effectiveness mitigate uh, e e effective mitigation strategies and uh, uh, categorize them in the three different level of effectiveness. And based on that, um, uh, we, we, we think it's, it's not realistic for the construction company to uh, implement all of the mitigation methods. So we introduced the performance index um, to, um, to, to, reply, to, to calculate the compliance rate for each of the factors. And because, because the, all of the factors are not equally in, important, so we, we use the PI total to calculate the, 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 the entire performance index to show the safety level um, of using UES in construction. And based on the, con the calculation process, there are three um, safety levels were derived, um, so which is shown in, in this table. In conclusion, this study proposed a practical model that can be used for assessing the safety level of using UAS in the construction industry um, by performing a mixed method approach, the literature review and a three-run Delphi process. And then the components of the practical model are expected to um, enable the practitioners uh, to recognize the causal factors of occupational safety health risks associated with um, the use of the UAS in construction. Yeah, so the, the component of the, of the model is expected, also expected um, to enable the practitioners um, to establish a procedure for selecting the proper UAS equipment with satisfactory quali uh, quality and the features for assisting with the different tasks in constructions because based on the top six um, identified causal factors, four of them are related to the UAS um, technology. And the, uh, and the third one is um, it hopefully can help them to uh, create the safety control programs uh, or adjust and uh, update their own safety control programs for UAS assisted project. However, the implementation and the validation of the pro post model are beyond the scope of the study and uh, the future research is needed to assess and validate the proposed model for various um, uh, uses of UAS in the construction. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, as Je just mentioned, we do um, have some time for Q&A. We've got a couple of minutes. We'll try to squeeze some in. Before we um, start that, though, I wanted to make people aware of um, a 2018 memo from OSHA on the use of unmanned aerial systems and in inspections. We're not going to talk about that, but we're going to put the link to it in the chat. So if you're interested, um, you can easily find it. A good number of the questions we received um, during registration and some that have come in during the session have been on licensing and training. Uh, where and how can I register to be a trained and licensed drone operator? I um, am going to ask our panelists if they would um, address this. Masood, do you want to take take that one? So, like uh, similar to when you get a driving license to drive a car from a DMV, you need to get a, a, a like a FAA Part One Hundred Seven certificate to be able to uh, drive or fly a drone. Uh, FAA is the like uh, organization federal aviation administration that also uh, does everything so the tests required to commercially fly drones any pilot that operates a drone to generate any kind of revenue must be certified by the faa part 107 and it's uh, it's just a knowledge test uh, about regulation aerospace requirement weather uh, loading and performance operation of the drones that like usually i think it takes two hour and then you get the test. After you get the test, you get the driving license or the certificate. And um, after that, you could uh, uh, register your drone 
and then you would be able to fly your drone. For sure, it shouldn't be in a no flight zone, like a dirt bunch of like using that uh, training, you'll understand what are the things that you could do and you cannot do, where you could fly, where you cannot fly. Uh, uh, but like uh, overall, uh, it, it has some, uh, like uh, there are some things that you need to follow when you are flying. Again, uh, the test is not hard. All my students already are certified, took them like a week or two to study for it. Uh, there are a bunch of like uh, links on YouTube and uh, FAA website. I've added them to the end of my presentation uh, also as a slide. So when I share it with everyone, they could, they could, uh, they could have that uh, links too. Would that respond to the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, another question that we had received a couple of times is, is there a size limit on drones that can be used for safety inspections? Meaning, is there a certain weight of a drone? Um, Dr. Handy, or did you address that one? The only thing that I, you know, that I see, and it, and it gets back to the other regulations, not necessarily an OSHA spec or anything, but it's less than 55 pounds is the, um, and if any, you know, anyone, if, um, you know, I, that I, I don't know of any other place that I see anything about a size limitation other than that. Okay. okay. Um, another question is what liability is involved while using a drone with an insurance carrier for damages from a drone? It's kind of a loaded question. Either you want to take that? Um, yeah, so, um, so the, the the current like insurance the the liability um uh, for the drones damage so that is include the personal injuries and the invasion of privacy um claims um and also the bodily injuries the, the medical expense um and also the property damages anybody else want to add to that Okay, um, a number of questions that we also received were um, the identifying the challenges of using drones in construction. Many of you brought that up during your presentations. Um, so why don't we just talk a little bit about that? Masood, do you wanna start it? Sure, uh, like, uh, the, like there are several uh, challenges when you wanna bring uh, flying robots on the construction job site. Like some of them is on the drone itself. Like there are a bunch of issues like radio communication signal loss uh, uh, or interferences that it might have with the metal uh, like uh, structure of the buildings. Uh, like uh, there are some complexity in terms of the user interface of the like the, uh, the drone ground station control station that when you're uh, like uh, controlling the drone. Uh, there are some restricted payload way that you need to uh, wait for the drone that you need to consider if you're mounting different type of drones. There are some restricted hardware and software also. So these are drone related. In terms of the human, for sure, we need to have uh, skilled pilots. Uh, uh, and also on the other, the worker side, we need to consider the negative psychological, and physiological effect, distraction, stress that it might bring to the job site. Regulations. Uh, we still, I think it's still kind of restrictive or unclear uh, uh, flight regulations uh, we have. And also in terms of the ethics, privacy issues, we need to consider uh, those regulations on whatever uh, flying job site. If you're flying in New York, when you have like uh, skyscrapers with windows on the side, like what are the issues that you need to consider? And finally, the environmental challenges like the weather conditions, the, the presence of other job site vehicles, crowded uh, surroundings, like the uh, trees, uh, power lines around it. These are all different type of challenges about drones, humans, regulations, and the environment uh, that the drone is flying. Thank you. Anyone want to add to that? Okay. Um, how are construction companies currently learning about drone technology? Where are they getting their information? Um, would one of you like to answer that? 
Um, yeah, so um, I think like in uh, the current practice, like most of the construction companies, um, they will hire the third party um, to, to do the, the UAS appli uh, applications in construction. Um, so this is a one way like they can get the knowledge about the drone technology. Um, and the, from the over study, and we, we receive um, we received the response that uh, fr from one um, person of uh, from one industrial personnel. So they mentioned that usually um, they just are based on like the advertisement and the public perception um, uh, uh, about the the different brand of the 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 UAS. Um, yeah, and the, this is a basic like how they select the 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 UAS. Um. Uh. I want to add something to that, uh, mm -hmm. as you said, like, yeah, uh, we are also seeing a tremendous increase in terms of the companies that provide services, fully online services for drone, like companies like Drone Deploy, Sky, uh, or like these are uh, making it simpler to use drones. Like nowadays, uh, you could just have the drone, you could connect it to the app, uh, you already selected the area on the job site, you click, it does everything. It flies, comes back, it, the data has already been captured, uh, it has been processed, and you're just using the data. That's, so it's on the go. And so it's getting cheaper and simpler to use. Uh, and also in terms of the training, I know there are a lot of training about how to fly the drones, like what is the best skill, but this is a skill that I believe might, like uh, as we move forward, uh, like, the drone's going to rely more on AI and uh, image processing and like so the drone's going to do the whole flying on their own. And there are companies like Skydio that they have fully autonomous drones that can, they don't need GPS or Wi-Fi or anything. Uh, they could fly indoor and outdoor fully autonomously. Uh, so these are the skills, like the skills of the users would much more on making sure that nothing, like if something, if the drone gets out of control, they could manually fly and also post-processing and using the data generated from the drones. So flying a drone, it's getting very, very simple nowadays. Thank you. Um, Rod, there was a question about your, um, your study. Is there any current data that you're aware of or plans for future air quality testing, nebulizing for large scale indoor commercial construction? Sorry about that. Not that I know. I, I do not know of any. Um, you know, I haven't researched that that you know that thoroughly thoroughly either. So there may be, I just don't I don't know of any. Okay. Well, I, we're coming up on about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we do have many more um, questions that were asked. So we understand that this is a really popular topic and Jess keeps all of the comments and she um, determines future webinars based on the registration comments and the questions asked in the QA. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for joining us today and sharing the um, findings from their small studies programs. It's amazing all the work that gets done on a small study. Um, and where it goes from there. So we're really excited about that. Um, just, are there any other closing remarks you need to make? Uh, no, I'll just ap apologize again in case people didn't see my chat. The date was wrong on the slides. That was just a typo on my end. We are not repeating this webinar, um, but we did record it. We will be automatically emailing it out to all of you um, along with the PDF of the slides so and the links that were shared in the chat. So. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. Great. Thanks to Thank all of you. our panelists for some great information. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.